All right, welcome to another episode of Closers or Losers. My name is Jeremy Miner. I am here uh, with my co-host, my business partner Matt Ryder, all the way over in our Sydney, Australia office. So let's let's go over you know let's go over something that a lot of people ask on different training calls, different lives have been on different events, and what does it actually take to become a top one percent salesperson in any industry? What I'd love you to do first and foremost is define what do you consider a top 1% salesperson because Ah. there's different industries, different money. If you're a super yacht salesman and you make one sale a year and you make $4 million commission, are you a top 1% sales rep? Okay. let's, Let's clarify this. If you're a super yacht salesperson, you only make one sale a year, you're going to be fired realistically. So you're not going to be a top form. You're not going to, they're not going to pay that guy $4 million commission off one sale a year for sure. With those type of, with, with, what is it? A $450 million boat? <laughs> Big yeah, boat. I think there's, there's quotas they have to hit. You know what I like to do? Like, cause a lot of people use, throw this word out there. Like, Oh, you're a legend. Like, Legend to me is something that I I call very few people because it's like it's like when you say you really like I love you you know like you're you're getting married like I love you you don't just throw that word out there to everybody right it doesn't mean much if you do yeah, yeah. so like when when somebody says like hey you're a legend and we'll get into like top one percent what's that mean like to me in my mind a legend in any industry is making at least three hundred. 500,000 plus a year commissions, period. That's a legend. That's somebody that people okay. remember 20, 30, 40 years later. Like a legend is not somebody like that guy or girl, you know, quits a year later and then two years later, nobody remembers who they were. That's not a legend. That's like it's not we- a flash in the pan. Someone with consistency, yeah, high level of revenue who can do it not only over one, one cycle, but over multiple cycles. Over many years. Right. That's a legend that makes that type of income at least three, four, five hundred, six hundred thousand a year. You know, I, I would say in my mind, a legend is somebody that actually makes seven figures a year as a W-2 or 1099 salesperson. I'm not talking about a business owner. So okay. when I say yeah. somebody's a legend, I really only reserve that role to somebody that makes at least a million dollars a year in commission in any industry. And we have a lot of legends in our training program that have now done that, you know. That's why I started calling Marco a legend when he made a million dollars. Uh, in commissions a couple of years ago before we hired him as the chief revenue officer over here. That's why I called you him. Yeah, that is the next level of inner circle. Legends. The legends. So let's let's talk about, you know, that's why I call you a legend, right? You made 1.5 million in You are the legend, you know? Year. Right. Yeah. That's a legend. That's something that I'm merely a humble servant, you know what I mean? For 10, 20, 30 years. Like your your name is just it, it stays in the history books. It's like if you're president of the United States, whether you're good, bad, or ugly, you're in the history books forever, all time, right? So top 1% salesperson. Um, I, I think, like I said, you got to make at least three, four, five hundred thousand 500,000 a year, depending on your industry. You know, if you're in an industry where, you know, there's a lot of fairly decent amount of people that already make 300 grand a year, you're not really a legend, right? Uh, but if you're, if there's several people making two, $300,000 a year and you make six or 700,000 a year, then you would be considered probably a legend because nobody's ever done that. They're like the trailblazer. Nobody's ever done that. Okay. Nobody, everybody, nobody thought it was even possible. What, in so just mind, to kind of surmise so far, it's like someone who is consistently outperforming industry standards. Big right? time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Consistently up, like highly, like, you know, doubling, tripling industry standards consistently yeah. over a long period of time. Is yeah. going to be a legend, but are they? Yeah. Are they yeah. the top one percent, Jeremy? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, let's talk about top one percent of of your industry. Right? Let's just let's just keep it simple. Yeah. You know, we can okay. talk about top one percent of any industry. That's a whole different level of of skill level. But let's talk about one top one percent of salespeople. So, in my mind, one of the biggest attributes a top one percent salesperson has that other people do not have because there's salespeople that will have good months, right? They, they'll make 20 grand a month in commission or 25 grand a month this month, but the next month they fall down to 10. And then even the a blind squirrel finds an acorn every now and then, right? Right. Every blind squirrel eventually finds a nut, right? I love that saying. Brian Tracy, I think said that. Um, so, you know, but they might make a 25 grand a month commission because they have one big sale this one month, but the next month they're at seven and the next month they're at 11. And you know, that's not somebody that's consistent enough. So you have to be consistent. 
like when I was a salesperson, like my numbers never went down. Like, you know, when I was making about 200 grand a month in commissions in, in really three of the four industries I was in, my numbers consistently stayed around that pace. Like there might've been a month I made like 173,000 a month in commissions. And the next month it was 215, but it wasn't like I made 205 one month. And then the next month I'm like making 38,000 in commissions. Does that make well, sense? Jeremy, that's consistent. because you got all the good leads. I know I got all the pink slip leads, you know, the, the Glenn Glary, uh, whatever yeah. that show is closers or what, <laughs> what's it? Yeah. Copies for closers, right? Yeah. Um, I got yeah, yeah, yeah. all the good leads. Everybody got the bad leads. That's, that's how I made all the money. These are the you money. See, I was leads. consistent, right? Like we had salespeople in my industries that they'd have a good month, you know, maybe they made 30 grand in commissions one month, but then the next month they'd be down at eight or seven, but they just weren't yeah. consistent. So in my mind, a top 1% salesperson, no matter their industry, is always consistent. Like you can count on that person to produce. What about you? Okay. Now, where, where does that, to sort of just to put, a, to put a flag in this point for a second, because I want people to understand your perspective on this, where does that consistency come from? Because like there are obviously just, there are variations in sales cycles that are outside of some 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 people's control, but there are yeah. lots of things that we can do. So, yeah, if if you're if you're consistently having an income that's say that's within ten percent, yeah, of the yeah. previous month, that's really consistent, right? Yeah. So where where does that come from, and what are the people who are not in that top one percent? What are they not doing to achieve that? The biggest thing I've I've seen from salespeople in any industry is they lack the right sales process, right? So in our sales process with NEPQ that we teach companies and reps, like you, you start from connecting questions to situation questions, to problem awareness, to solution awareness, to consequence, to transitioning into either booking a demo or booking a proposal, whatever you're in, or maybe you're transitioning into a presentation and it's a one call close. If you sell B2C, if you sell B2B, it's transitioning into the next step, right? So there's this consistent sales process that you're following on every single call, every single appointment. And you know, when you're consistent like that, you're going to get a consistent result. But what okay. I see so many sales reps do, and we've talked about this before, is they don't really have a sales process. Or if they do have one, it doesn't really work that well. So it's like one month, they get a little bit easier leads. And the next month, the leads are a little bit harder, not as good. So their income dips way down. And they're just out there winging it on every call. So it's like one month, they winged it a little bit better than the next, but then their income dips down. So I think one of the biggest things is really the sales process, having a consistent sales process, like you said, that you knew if you had this amount of calls per day, per week, yeah. and you followed the exact steps of the sales process, you were going to close around the same percentage every week, every month. What about your, so, your thoughts? So that, that, that process, because I'm interested in your thoughts, besides the fact that it's a, it's a better process with and then skills and all that kind of stuff yeah. from from my perspective mm. that following that helps to detach from the outcome uh, describe to, to everybody what you mean by that so if i'm like if i okay you take a driving range yeah right for a golf reference and then teeing off on the first hole yeah it's yeah. the exact same thing mm. the only difference is that there's a consequence of stuffing up one versus the other yeah right but if i follow the exact same process every single time yeah. and i just did my thing it wouldn't matter if i was in front of twenty thousand people one person no one on a driving range it wouldn't matter i just follow the process and i think that's the difference between professional golfers and amateur golfers is that the externalities of what's happening around them mm. do not affect their process whereas people change what they do based off the situations that they're in. Whereas like what I'm hearing from you and correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. is that having a sales process that you follow mm. with a religious like kind of zealotness, you know what I mean? Like yeah, you, you are, that. you are going, you, you follow your process no matter what. Yeah. Right. Then if, if somebody buys great, yeah, the process worked. If somebody doesn't buy, that's fine too, because you did the process, which works most of the time. Yeah, exactly. I don't need to change anything really. Exactly. But that's that, like, maybe you don't realize how incredibly powerful that is because so many people, and I'm sure a lot of the people that are listening to this and watching this on YouTube and like, let us know if, if this is you, like sort of like, you know, put it like, put it in the comment section, like, are, do you, are you confident enough in your process to where you are just happy to do it? it yeah. you're, you're not, you're not attached to the outcome because the win is not in getting the sale. Thank you, sir. The win 
is in just doing your process consistently enough yeah. and having a process that's good enough to know that doing the process is enough. Like if a professional golfer hits a shank, like they don't change anything. They don't change their swing. Right? They're like, oh my swing works. I'm changing my swing. I think you're so right. You look at Tiger Woods and, you know, back in his heyday when he was younger, when he was winning all these tournaments, his process. We still winning, bro. Pretty, well, yeah, of course. But you know what I mean? He's a savage, right? But he, yeah. his process was pretty much the same. Now he could make some tweaks here and there, but it wasn't like he was like completely changing his swing right now. He's always tweaking here and there, but he knew that if he had this process, he was going to get a certain type of result and that yeah. where he won more than anybody else. Yeah. And I think this is an incredibly good learning experience for especially younger or more inexperienced uh, sales reps or even experienced ones that are that are having those ebbs and flows and yeah. you know, sales is a numbers game and all that kind of stuff to like people talk about detaching from the sale. Yeah. Right. So you don't get commission breath. And listen, that's a, it's a very easy thing to say when you don't need money. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But I think, um, like what really changed it for me when I was learning from you mm. and I was like, I remember like the first time I sat down in a coaching session and I got presented with a script and got through it. And what are you selling and how do we do this? And yada, yada, yada. Mm. Right. And I was like, okay, I am going to become obsessed with this process. Yeah. I want to understand it. I want to dissect it. Yeah. I want to live and breathe an EPQ. Yeah. Uh, this is the only thing that I will think about. Um, and I will understand this back to front. And do, by doing that and by surrendering to that, and even though I was a, a fairly successful sales rep as it was, although that wouldn't pay my mortgage these days, what I used to make. <laughs> would even um, pay your mortgage, dude. <laughs> right? So, um, but like have, having that and, and being able to have that as a fallback, I stopped caring if I made the sale and I started caring about the mastery of doing what I was doing. Yeah. And the byproduct of that was I was making a lot more sales. Yeah. In the same way that if I'm focusing on my shooting and my trigger pull and my body position, right? And if I do all those things correctly and I shoot, most of the time I'll hit the target. Yeah, it's Sometimes the target. there's a big old gust of wind and, that you couldn't predict and that's fine, these things happen. But yeah. I went through my process. It was a good shot. I went yeah, through my you're process. You're going to nail it nine out of 10 cool. times. Exactly. exactly. And I think that's a really important concept. And what I'd love to know from you is like, did you have a moment when you actively like released yourself from the ebbs and flows of learning a process and being a young sales professional and making yeah. sales and approaching doors? Like, when did you start to, I guess, almost gamify the, the, the process? I, you know, it was a, well, I think I would say within the first like three to four months of me being in sales. So like my first month that I've struggled, you know, you've heard my story. I didn't hardly make any sales, almost quit, you know, learning all these skills from the old sales gurus. A lot of them didn't work, triggered sales resistance. You know, same time I'm going to college studying behavioral science. And I'm like, how do I take, you know, human behavior, behavioral science, plug it into the sales process. And once I figured that out after two or three months, I got pretty damn consistent in the process for what I was selling. And I stuck to that religiously. And there would be days you know, there, there was never a day I did not make a sale. You know, when I started out door-to-door -door sales, you know, I was in that industry for, you know, five years, four or five years or something. And there was, there was some days where there was never a day where I, we always call it bageled. Like if you didn't make a sale, you bageled, right? And a lot of, and a lot <laughs> of sales door-to-door -door -door terms. Yeah, they call it bagel. A lot of sales I would have got a bagel, would. but I got a one-legger right last minute. A lot minute. of sales would. You know, a lot of sales people, they might sell three in one day and the next two days they don't sell any. I never literally never had a day where I made zero sales. But I do remember there was a few times where I remember I was going all day from like 11 in the morning till eight at night, had not made one sale. And I'm like, is this going to be the day where I don't make a sale? It's like, it's like Michael Jordan, like goes without scoring any points. It's like, what, what is happening here? But I knew if I followed <laughs> the process that I would get that sale. And every single time that last hour, I'd make a sale. And this was very rare. Most, most of the time, it was usually three or four a day, right? Sometimes five a day, sometimes six a day. But I knew if I followed my process, that it would all end up the same at the end of the week. And I would maybe make one sale, barely made it like last door I knocked on. Then the next day, go out and I make six. And now I'm right back to the normal three or four a day, right? Because I followed that process religiously. 
And so once you lock into NEPQ and you learn the process and you follow religiously, like it didn't really bother me because like I had that one sale, but I'm like, oh, well, I'll go out tomorrow and you know, I'll probably sell the first three doors you know, because I'm following the same process. So it, there really wasn't the pressure there like most salespeople would have where they would bagel one or two days in a row. Then they would question themselves and like, oh, I need to change. And then like the next day they do one, the next day they do zero and like they don't know what's going on. They're like sweating at night, you know? Yeah. Uh, nervous uh, it was one of our inner circle out. clients who I, where I work quite closely with because he's in Australia. He lives yeah. just down the road. So he comes in and yeah. does sales calls from here and stuff like that. And he goes to me, he goes, man, I, I didn't like his close rate since joining has gone from 13 to 69%. That's, right? pretty, that's a pretty big okay. Um, I've been, I've been helping him out a little bit more than the usual because yeah, yeah, yeah. he's here. But yeah. Um, and he goes to me, he goes, I had a bad day. I went like, oh, from four. So I think I need to tweak this. I was like, fucking stop. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I was like, mate, slow down. One bad day. Like, did you close really well yesterday? Yes, yeah, sweet. Okay, so if you combine the numbers of yesterday and today, what are you at? He's like 60%. I was like, congratulations. That's remarkable. I was like, why are you looking at these micro, tiny little cycles of time? Yeah. And then, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like yeah. it's like if you walked into a gym one day and you were a little bit weaker because you were tired and didn't sleep well, yeah. and then you decided to throw out your entire training regime because you weren't making progress. Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Well, right. it's just like, it's like Steph Curry, right? The three point shooting phenomenon. And he, you know, one, one game he goes and he, he, he shoots two of 12 from, from the three point line. And so he's shooting 15%. He's like, oh my gosh, I got to completely change everything. Like he wouldn't do that. Cause the next day he's going to go out and he's, he's going to be like eight for 14. <laughs> yeah. It's you know what I'm so saying? Crazy. Like he wouldn't just go out and change everything. Cause he has the process down. 100%. Exactly. Okay. So the top 1%, the people who are killing it, they, they have a process, yeah. right? And they're, that allows them to detach from the outcome yeah. and just focus on doing something rather than trying to get something, right? Like they have, they have, there's a thing that you can focus on. Okay. So now what are the, what's the inverse of that? Like the people who you see who are constantly struggling, right? Like remove like the process, like yeah, what do yeah. you see as really, really common faults that are outside of what we just spoke about that the top, that the bottom 99% are doing compared to the top 1% yeah. that, be, yeah. that is able to create yeah. consistency besides yeah. just process and all that kind of stuff? Uh, I think the biggest thing is they're not disciplined enough. They don't have any discipline, right? They, they, uh, they wake up late, you know, they, they might have to get to the office by eight. So they're waking up at seven 15, like just not even mentally prepared for the day, running into the office, getting on the first sales call, like barely making it. They're just not, they're not even prepared. They're just not disciplined enough to even prepare themselves. Like a top salesperson, like you have to have extreme discipline. You have to get up. Like when I was in sales, I got up at a certain time. I had a routine that I freaking followed. Just like, you know, I hear stories of like LeBron James or Michael Jordan or Tom Brady or all these, you know, Tiger Woods, all these legends. It's like they follow a regiment. Like when they're in their profession, they're up at a certain time, they're doing things at a certain time. And so they are mentally prepared that when they go into that ball game, they know exactly what to do. And I think most salespeople just aren't. They're just, they go into the office because that's what they have to do. They're not mentally prepared. They don't do any research on maybe the, you know, they're in B2B sales, maybe the prospect they're about to talk to you. They don't, you know, they just don't mentally prepare. They don't rehearse their lines. They don't memorize their questions. You know, like for this prospect, you know, I'm, I'm going to meet with this company today or whatever. I need to ask these type of questions. They don't rehearse it. They don't write it down. So they're just not disciplined enough to take their profession that seriously. And it shows in their income. Okay. Well, you know, I was on a training with our guys yesterday. Yeah. And uh, we were going through objection handling. Um, and you know, we, we teach like there's mon like, like logistical objections, right? The way in which any PQ does it, I think is very elegant, um, yeah. you know, with the diffusing and discussing all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. So we were teaching that. And I, I sort of said to all of them, I was like, who here can just rattle this off the top of their head? Yeah. And not many of them could. And I said, <laughs> okay, if you can't do that, you're not trying hard enough. And then I went through every objection and I rattled off exactly how to handle it from the top of my head. Yeah. I was like this, 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 this. Yeah. And I said, 
you guys need to become obsessed with this process. And you're not sure. you're not disciplined enough to know exactly where to take any conversation, no matter what happens. That's true. There were, and there were one or two that could do it, and those people probably the two of them on that the two of them that could probably earned more than everybody else in that call combined. A hundred percent. You know, and one of them is seventeen years old. Yeah, it's it's right? it's hundred percent accurate because if you if you don't know like every every sales call is different. It's it's not like it's like a basketball game. Like every basketball game is going to be different. You know, LeBron James. It's not like the same basketball game. There's different appointment uh, uh, opponents. They do different things. They make different moves. Right? Like he knows how to adjust. That's why he's great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the people on the bench, even though they're in the NBA, they're not as good because they don't know how to adjust as well. And it's the yeah. same thing in sales, right? Like the greatest of sales people, the top 1% of the legends know how to adjust no matter what's thrown at them by the prospect. They just know how to react. They know what to say. They know how to disarm. Then they know how to ask certain questions that allow the prospect to overcome the objection. They just know what to do at every stage. And that's why they win sales that are like on the fence that most salespeople cannot make. You know, yep. salespeople can get the laydowns and you can make some money doing that. But if you want to be great, if you want to be at the top 1%, you're getting like, where's the other, let's say your close rate is 20%, right? So you're getting like 10% laydowns, 10% that, you know, you resolve a few concerns that you know, and you get them in. But how do you get, what about the other 80%? Let's say there's 20% that are never going to buy for whatever reasons, right? They're just broke as a joke. There's no way they can do it if they wanted to. But where does that leave the other 60% in the middle? The other 60% in the middle go either direction, depending on your sales ability. Exactly. Right? And let's say that, you know, you have everything memorized. You know exactly what to do in every situation. You're going to get a majority of that 60% to go your way. And that's why you make so much more money. 100%. And I think like there are some hard truths that I think salespeople need to hear. Yeah. And there is no great salesperson that doesn't make a lot of money. Absolutely. There is no great salesperson. <laughs> I love when they're like, oh, he's, he or she's great at sales. I'm like, well, how much money do they make? Oh, they make this. I'm like, no, they're not that great at sales. Money yeah. talks. Commission well, checks talk. It, it's the only metric in which you can, of, of which you can really say how good you are. Yeah, well, right? it's like a, saying an NBA basketball player is great and they score seven points a game. Well, this is a great thing. Somebody asked me the other day and they're like, how can you tell a great salesperson? And I said, well, first of all, great salespeople make a lot of money. Second of all, great salespeople always have jobs. There is no great salesperson who is looking for a job because when you're great at sales, people know, Yep. right? Like it's not, it's the secret gets out. When yeah. people figured out that I could sell, I had business owners throwing themselves at me yeah 100 like comically yeah right because they're like oh this guy can make me money yeah and it's like the analogy i use is there are no nba level basketball players yeah. that are not in the nba yeah <laughs> i agree like that's where they are yeah, <laughs> because they are. their skill level because their skill level and like you have to be a freak to be in the nba like you have to be crazy good at basketball you have to be incredibly good at football to be in the nfl yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And there are just no amazing football players that are just didn't get their shot. <laughs> like, I, I totally agree. It's just like <laughs> Steve Martin says, you know, the actor said, become so great that they cannot ignore you, right? Like great salespeople, you cannot ignore them. Like, I don't care if they're like two feet tall, if, you know, they're from the planet the Mars. They have is incredible. Whatever. If they're selling, you don't, you can't ignore them as a business owner. They will always be promoted. They will always be paid the most. They'll always have the best office. They'll always have the best opportunities because of their production. You can't ignore production. Production is never ignored. Exactly. And if you are like absolutely killing it, it's very difficult for business owners to turn you away. Oh, 100%. It's very you're difficult last, when you go to them to say, hey, bro, I want more money. You're the last one to go. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, you just can't. All right. So I think it's a pretty good, you know, a pretty good wrap up. I'd love to know everyone's thoughts as to what you think a top 1% sales rep is yeah, and what yeah. you think, I guess, is a reason why you are or why you're not a top 1% sales rep at the moment. I got one last thing. So the third thing that I see is they are committed to being the best top salespeople, top 1%. Like they are literally committed. That's an obsession. To mastering the skill. Like you said, they're, they're obsessed 
was becoming great because, hey, if they're going to work that 40, 50 hours a week anyways, why not make the most amount of money you can in that time? You're going to be working anyways. Like, Why not convert two or three times more than you are? It doesn't make sense not to if you're still going to put in the hours. Absolutely. So you have to be committed. You, you're committed. You're disciplined. Committed to be the best. You're disciplined 100%, 1,000%. And you have the right sales process, you're pretty much unstoppable. You can go sell anything in the world, write your own ticket, do anything you want, get recruited by any company you want in the world, sell anything you want. I can assure you that. I mean, I was getting calls from headhunters probably three to five a day that were just getting routed into my assistant. So at, at some point, you couldn't return the calls because it was too distracting. But I even had offers to go sell like Boeing jets, you know, to like countries over in the Middle East, you know? Fun. I had to move to Washington, D.C. I didn't really want to do that. So you'll get offers to sell anything. Once you produce, it gets out there and you'll never go without. I mean, the, the whole economy could crash and you're still going to be making tons of money. <laughs> yeah. All right. So if people want to learn the skills yeah. to be a top 1% sales rep, Jeremy, what should they do? Yeah. So, like, hey, you guys want to, hey, let's say you're a salesperson. You want to start making 10 grand a month in commissions or 20 grand a month in commissions or 30 grand a month in commissions or 40 or 50 grand a month in commissions. You want those skill levels. For your first step is go to our free Facebook group. That's salesrevolution.pro. Salesrevolution.pro. You go to salesrevolution.pro. You join for free. We've got about 17, some thousand salespeople in there. Started that a little bit over a year ago. And once you join the group, uh, check your DMs because somebody in our, on our team will message you a free training called the NEPQ 101 mini course uh, by my good business partner here, Matt. And he's going to break down the NEPQ sales process and give you several different questions you can ask for different sales situations that's going to help you some more. We go live in that Facebook group about three to four times a week with different training on subject matter, different objection handling skills, objection prevention, and different Q&As every single week. So just go to salesrevolution.pro. There should be a link there. Join for free. We'll see you on the inside. Matt, keep everybody safe over there. We are signing off here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Thanks, everybody. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed these, here's another you can watch right over here, right over here. Join our free Sales Revolution group. Click the link below. Join us and we're going to help you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you real soon.